Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Get Outdoors PA webinar, Diversity and Inclusion Initiative and Thoughts in Outdoor Programming. Thank you, all for, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Nikki Tusher, and I'm the Director of Training in Get Outdoors PA. With me today is Emily Gates, the Director of Strategic Partnerships, and she is running the technical side for us. This webinar is funded in part by the Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society and a grant from the Environmental Stewardship Fund under the administration of the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Bureau of Recreation and Conservation. started, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping points. This webinar is being recorded and all participants are on mute. If you have questions or comments, please submit them in the chat box at the bottom left side of your screen. The speakers will either address them during the webinar or at the end. You will receive a link to the recorded webinar and a copy of the presentation slides following the webinar via email. A little, back, a little background on who we are. Get Outdoors PA is a joint initiative among community and statewide partners. It connects citizens with outdoor recreation activities to increase their appreciation and active use of parks, forests, and public spaces while communicating a message of environmental stewardship and healthy living. Get Outdoors PA partners are committed to providing outdoor recreation programs in the communities they serve their programs feature activities such as hiking, camping, fishing, archery, and biking. The Get Outdoors PA flagship partners are listed on your screen. In addition, the program has 84 state park partners and 167 community partners, which are made up of park and rec departments, land trusts, environmental education centers, and more. If you are interested in becoming a community partner, which we hope you are, Look for the link at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. <clears throat> Keisha Scovens is co-founder and director of community outreach of Let's Go Outdoors. Keisha oversees Let's Go Outdoors therapeutic program initiatives, focusing on improving speech communication skills among kids and youth using outdoor activities and themes. She serves as a national speaker with Diverse Environmental Leaders Speakers Bureau, <clears throat> has served as a panelist for multiple outdoor and environmental conferences, and is program manager for the Let's Go Outdoors Nature Intervention Initiative. She holds a Master of Science in Speech and Language Pathology from Gallaudet University and a Bachelor's from Loyola University in Maryland. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tarsha Scovens is co-founder and director of programming of Let's Go Outdoors. With over 20 years of leadership, programming, and coordination experience, along with a passion for the outdoors, Tarsha is spearheading a movement to ethically, excuse me, ethnically diversify outdoor participation. She serves as Southeast Regional Director for the Pennsylvania Association of Environmental Educators, is a volunteer teacher with Keep Philadelphia Beautiful, and board member for Friends of High School Park. Tarsha holds a master's in professional communication from LaSalle University and a bachelor's in liberal studies from Virginia Wesleyan College. Keisha and Tarsha, would you like to say hello? Hello. And Keisha, please say hello. Hello, this is Keisha. Everybody always says we sound the same, so if you think you're talking to or hearing the same voice through the whole webinar, you probably aren't. We're going to try and identify ourselves as we go through. Well, All wonderful, right. and thank you both for being here. And now I'm going to hand everything over to Tarsha. Excellent. So thank you for that wonderful introduction, and we are so appreciative to be part of this webinar series that is being hosted. Keisha and I were thinking, wow, this is such a great opportunity for us, especially because we've been at this work for a number of years. We're excited to share, and hopefully um, as we go through this webinar, we can impart some knowledge that can help as other organizations or individuals think through 
diversity and inclusion and the programs that we've done hopefully can be of help as we share about those. So, of course, this is our diversity and inclusion initiatives and thoughts. We are going to hopefully hear some of your thoughts as we go through, and we will start to move forward in our slides. So for our session, for the webinar format as we go through today, we are going to definitely share the mission of Let's Go Outdoors and then also the importance of the work that we're doing and the importance of diversity and inclusion. And of course, we want to talk about setting the tone, the programs that we've done. We want to share the successes, the challenges, and definitely other resources, other organizations that are out there and then moving forward in your own in your own organization. And hopefully we'll be able to share some thoughts as well. But that's kind of the format that we'll follow. And we're going to just jump right in. All right. So the the bare bones mission of Let's Go Outdoors is really to connect city communities to outdoor experiences. And we do that through four different ways. And I have to tell you that when we started the organization about eight years ago, it was really in regards to starting just to say, let's get individuals in our community outdoors. And um, myself, well, I was in Philadelphia, in Germantown, Mount Airy, West Oak Lane, and these are definitely communities of color, which is where I live. And we just wanted to say, let's get outdoors. We want other people to do camping, hiking, fishing, that kind of thing. And we couldn't find a lot of individuals. But over the years, we started to say, let's define this a little bit more. And so we broke it down into four, um, I guess, pieces. So the first is community education. And then we also do diversity initiatives, which is our conversation today. And then family connection activities. And then we also do collaboration and partnerships. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Keisha kind of start to discuss a little bit of the highlights of some of these programs and maybe a few examples. Okay, everybody, this is Keisha. So again, I might sound like Tarsha, but hopefully you can hear how much pep is in my voice and the excitement that I've got here for Let's Go Outdoors. Now, just to give you a little bit of backstory, because Tarsha forgot to mention or did not mention how much our mission is definitely aligned with our lives. So our mission is our life, so to speak. So Tarsha and I, again, did not grow up in these wonderfully outdoor affiliated homes. We grew up as city kids, city communities. And so when we thought about this mission of our own kids and what we were doing as we were getting older, starting families, we were like, well, we want more people that look like us to be doing stuff outdoors. And that's where the mission really developed. And that's what we really wanted to get at when we started to develop these several initiatives that we started. So like Tarsha said, we do those things through four different areas. And so we wanted to kind of, or I'm going to highlight several of those areas and where we've been in the past eight years because it has been a journey, as many of you know. Um, so one is in the area of watershed education. So our watershed education program really is much very much based in the community where we are going out and we are bringing watershed education to school communities and to communities um, that usually are not touched by this type of education. We are talking to families when they are at community events. So this could be fairs, this could be, I mean, back in the day, Sarsha and I would do flea markets, whatever it took really to reach the community where they were at. And so that would be talking about the local watershed, how do we keep our water you know, as clean as possible because it is our source of our drinking water. So we really wanted to do that, and we are able to reach large numbers of people through our subcontract with the Philadelphia Water Department and being able to provide that watershed education, which is what we do, like I said, in classrooms, through schools, and then we are also able to do that through community events. The other thing that we do that you'll see there is our after-school programs. And so through after-school programs, we are able to work through community centers or particular private centers that are really, we're really able to reach out to kids. And again, one of the things that we've learned through doing this type of programming is we need to kind of meet 
families where they're at. And a lot of times, one of the things when we get into diversity in certain neighborhoods, when we start to talk about that, is we sometimes overlook the fact that we think that the parents are these wonderful role models for some of these outdoor-based activities. However, through our after-school programs and reaching out to kids, we've realized that our parents are sometimes not necessarily those that can, can really encourage that. So we said, wow, let us reach out to the kids. And most people know that if you can reach the kids, you can usually reach the household, which is the parents. So we've had quite a number of kids participate, and we've also found out, too, that there's not a lot of them that are doing outdoor recreation activities beyond what we are providing to them in the schools. And that's one of the things we've learned, too, about being in city communities. We don't have these wonderful green spaces that necessarily look, that look like super-duper parks or state parks, but we do see nature in everywhere. So we are able to impart that on them. The other thing that you'll see there at the top on the right are grant-funded programs. So through our grant-funded programs, we are able to bring specialized programming to neighborhoods. And so we have been able to receive funding from places like DCNR, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. So through those, through those sources, we've been able to bring programming to neighborhoods. And that's one thing that's been pretty much vital to our organization because of the fact that we can reach people where they're at. It's not necessarily only a, a touch point or a trip to somewhere, but we're actually meeting them where they are and introducing them to nature and what's around them in their actual area. On the bottom, we have the family caregiver programs. And so again, like I said, a lot of times we overlook the fact that our parents or the caregivers, the adult caregivers that are in the homes with a lot of our children are not always understanding the importance of nature in the outdoors. So one of the things that we wanted to do is really make it user-friendly for the whole family. Sometimes we've run into families that really feel like they don't know how to encourage that or they're feeling like there is a limitation in their own ability to be that role model, be that person who can show them, well, how do we go fishing? How do we go camping? How do we go on a nature walk? Where do we do that? So we've been able to really customize our programming to provide the materials. You know, we don't want the barrier to access being the materials and equipment needed, and we want to make sure families know that it's okay to not know, and that's been something that's been significant for us. So that's generally some of the highlights of our programs and what we've been able to do, but at this point, you know, we want to talk about, well, why do we do this? You know, why is this important? What do we want to see happen when we talk about diversity and inclusion? So again, I'm Keisha. I'm going to turn it over to Tarsha now, so it's going to be her turn. So she is going to be back on the mic, so to speak. All right, thanks, Keisha. So part of what we want to make sure, because we are all on this phone line, because we feel that there's an importance. But sometimes, and I have to say that in many multiple situations, it's really some, some individuals feel like, why would this be important? You know, why do we want to have diversity and inclusion? in the whole environmental theme of things or in the outdoors. And I have to say that it's just not on the side of one demographic. And again, we do speak in terms of, you know, people of color being African Americans, as Keisha and I, or we know that it's a heavily um, white represented, Caucasian represented field in a sense. But why is it important? And we hear from both sides, like, you know, what does diversity mean? One thing, and then also, why is it important? So one is because in the future, um, we could say, use the word global majority in a sense, but our world will be pretty much a um, demographic that is not one identity, uh, one, not one ethnicity. I know that the realm of Hispanic population basically is growing, so we know that that's even increasing. But we have to really think about that. So we have to educate um, multiple demographics to understand the importance of their environment. And then also environmental issues, because the next piece is we know that environmental issues, especially in regards to low-income, high-poverty communities, especially where there is a number of audiences that are people of color, we have to really think about what's happening in those communities. And we know that there is high asthma rates in those communities due to litter, due to pollution, and then also just the factories that are in these environments. 
So we have to really educate. And if we can't get people outdoors and thinking about their environment, whether it be positive, whether it be issues that are challenges, then we are never going to be able to help in that. And we need to be educating in all communities, especially if we want to change those environmental impacts. The other thing is employment, right? Everybody needs employment or income. And we have to really think about where are individuals thinking about employment? And we know that there is a limited number of people of color. The percentages are out there. We're not going to go through tons of statistics today because I think we all know them on this phone. But I would like to say that employment is very important, especially to people of color. Our biggest piece is we know that we are coming out of um, pretty much low income, high poverty uh, pieces, if you will, or arenas. And so we have to really think about where does the employment exist? And we know that there's employment if we can start to learn about our environment in the outdoors. So that's another one. And then better quality of life outcomes, right? We understand that, especially in suburban populations, we have to say that there is higher academic achievement scores if we can get kids out in nature. In urban communities, we may see that as well. And then also thinking about the better quality of life, I mean, we know that it can heal the mind, body, and spirit, of course. So we want that as well. So Keisha's going to be talking later on in regards to those therapy initiatives that we're doing to incorporate environmental education in the outdoors. But we are looking at better quality of life as well. And then, of course, we know that all of our spaces, our public lands, belong to everybody. And so we want everybody to feel included, that this is our land that we can share and that we can love, that we can really grow and sustain in a healthy way. So those are key things why this is important. And I know that we might be preaching to the choir in a way, but at the same time, it's just always good to think about that. Because even on both sides, as I mentioned before, we're really talking to two sides of the spectrum in regards to why diversity and inclusion is important sometimes. So the next piece that we want to think about is, all right, so when we talk those words, what do they really mean? We've got to really set a tone. And as you're going back to your team, as you're going back to your groups, you have to say, all right, where are we starting at? Where are we going with this? So let's start with, what does it mean? All right, Keisha, tell us. Okay. Keisha's here. So pep peppiness, that's me. So we are going to go through samples, okay? We're talking about diversity and we're talking about disadvantaged, okay? Because again, when we talk about diversity, as you can see the, the dictionary definitions there, but when we're looking at diversity as far as let's go outdoors, we are talking to communities of color. So that's where we are at. We're looking at diversity in the aspect of people from different cultural backgrounds, people from different ethnic backgrounds. We're also looking at diversity as we move into talking, I'll talk about the piece later, our special needs population. But diversity is all around us. Now we are in a Philadelphia-based community is where we are at in the state of Pennsylvania. So when we talk about diversity, Philadelphia has many, many, many people in it, representative of many, many different cultures, very much different in many different ways. So we want to make sure that we talk about the fact that diversity looks very different in different places. Okay? The other thing is thinking about that word disadvantaged. Now sometimes we can look at very large cities or look at certain demographics. If we take, again, Philadelphia, large cities, we sometimes will see because larger areas, of course, are going to be more diverse and larger areas are also going to have more disadvantaged community, so to speak, just because they are very much larger. But we want to make sure we stay away from thinking that diversity and the fact of um, people of color doesn't always refer to being disadvantaged. So I just want to make sure that we put that out there because sometimes there is the stereotype of, oh my goodness, diversity means disadvantaged. So again, we also want to take into the into consideration the fact that there's different socioeconomic levels. And when you have diversity, there are going to be people from very different socioeconomic levels that look um, similar or they may look very different. Okay, I wanted to just kind of step back for one moment. So Tarsha had talked about that whole employment piece and thinking about that, when we think about diversity, disadvantaged communities, we know that diversity-wise there are pieces and aspects um, of employment that are very different. We already said we know that the outdoor arena, environmental ed, nature-based education, these are very much predominantly um, Caucasian-based jobs. When we talk about disadvantaged 
communities, we always are talking about jobs also, but we want to kind of move into different types of employment. And one of the things that we've been learning through this, um, through this work is that disadvantaged communities sometimes are not even familiar with some of the jobs that are out there. And when I speak to Tarsha and I, you know, being part of the mission, you know, I must say that we are learning as we go about all these different careers that relate to the outdoors that we never even thought of. And so when we talk about, you know, diversity, yes, there's just not a lot of diversity in the field, but when we move down to our disadvantaged communities, they're not even aware that the jobs exist and that they are possibilities for them. So just want to make sure that we put that out there because I'm like, wow, I never even knew that there was such and such job out there, you know, I think what was something that I learned about. You know, I never knew the title. I mean, I guess I realized there were people that did this, but urban forestry was like something I just was like, oh, I never even thought about that. Even things like city planning, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, that's something different. But again, these are those things that I think that um, people from certain communities are not necessarily always going to think about because, again, disadvantage, you don't always have access to certain things, and then also diversity-wise, if you don't see people that look like you in certain positions, then that's a limitation also. Okay? So what are we moving on to now? Tarsha is going to take over the mic again. All right. So excellent. Thanks. Thank you, Keisha. So Ethan, are we ready to actually start the party, right? So we first always say, and I put this picture up there, we have always said that it's, it's a question party, yay! And both of us have kids, so we always think of them, and so that's the key thing. My favorite, who loves to ask questions? And that's part of this work as well. And if you have questions, don't forget, type them into that question box because we hopefully will have a discussion and we can have some thoughts on this conversation because Keisha and I don't know everything. We are learning as we go um, as well. But let's really, who are we talking to? Again, we have got to set the tone. When we sit at meetings, and Keisha and I have been through this multiple times, where everyone at the table doesn't even see the definition as the same. Yes, we just showed you the slide with diversity and disadvantage, but also there's multiple other words that people are using. Urban, what is it? Um, I just get my mind and I apologize. So the key thing is, what words are we thinking about? When we say underrepresented, when we say urban, when we use terms like bias, what are we talking about? Especially if you seek grants for your organization, is everybody on the same page as to why we're asking the question or who we actually are trying to reach? So part of it is saying, let's sit down, let's define, let's talk so we can determine what we're really thinking about in regards to diversity and inclusion. So again, we ask these questions, but at the same time, this isn't where we're asking you to provide answers at this point in time unless you would like to. So when you sit down at those tables, you know, what do the current users look like? We've run into many organizations, and many organizations don't really realize what their demographic is um, or realize that it's a majority one, but then aren't really sure what the other is. So who is the organization trying to reach? And as Keisha mentioned, Basically, it can look very different in different places. And part of our work is here in Philadelphia, as we mentioned, and we're dealing with a very high African-American population because that's who we represent. And then what does your administration, the workforce, look like? And there's multiple, many other questions that, as a team, your group can actually start to think about when you start to move into the realm of saying, we really want to put diversity and inclusion in the forefront, but what does that mean? So let's set the tone. Let's talk about it. Let's define it. So we can move forward in a positive and a strategic way, not just a let's pull it together and then everybody just says, all right, we can check that off. Okay. So as we move forward, all right, so we've set the tone, we've asked some questions, we've defined, we've looked at, okay, a program, an organization that's, that's doing this type of work. What else do we need to keep in mind, right? All right, as we start to dig deeper. We look at diverse populations, diverse perspectives, right? So let's talk about that. What do we learn as we start to go into these communities? So what we want to say is, one, we pulled out some information. As we start thinking about what do particular ethnicities, if we will, would like to talk about, or how do they engage in the outdoors? So we found that Hispanic groups perform more group and family activities, you know, those tables. 
And some places that we've been to have tables, some places don't. And I have to say, one of the programs that we're going to be talking about is that some people will not even sit on the ground. Even if the grass looks beautifully manicured in any way, some people will not, and we already know that. And then also, African Americans prefer well-maintained landscapes and team rather than individual sports. So I have a really clear example of this. We are working with an organization, Friends of the Wissahickon, and they are here in the Philadelphia area, and basically they've asked us to do some survey work. And as we're completing these surveys, and they would like to engage and learn from an external audience, not just the audience that's actually coming on site to their location, but they are actually asking how come those that are in the vicinity of the park, especially those that meet the demographic that doesn't look like those, like Caucasians that are consistently visiting, but they want to find out since this with the Hicken Creek flows through multiple neighborhoods that don't aren't Caucasians, they wanted to find out. So they contracted with us and partnered with us to actually learn more. So we were going out doing the survey, and one of the questions is, what would you change about the park that, would, that you would like to let them know? And I kid you not, everybody that's listening on the phone, the biggest piece that has come up in some of those surveys is they would like some of the trees to be cut down. And now that sounds really funny, thinking about environmental education, being in the outdoors, but why would somebody say, okay, well, cut down some of the trees? The key point is, um, in certain demographics, and I do get it, especially being an African American, it is the safety issue. You know, well-maintained means that, okay, it probably is safe, so we don't want it to where it's going to be, I'm hidden, or somebody could be sneaking up or creeping up on us. But at the same time, that's just something that I thought was a little interesting to hear that. And then also women, especially with children, prefer group activities and well-maintained, secure landscapes. Again, that safety issue comes in. At the same time, group activities. Is there programming at your locations that engages people that have families? Not just saying, let's take a trail walk or a hike or anything like that, but is there something that is planned that brings people into a certain space that they can interact with? So those are just a few of the pieces that we learned about as we are doing some of this work and looking at it. So our next slide, what we would like to see is and talk about is our, our program. So what is Let's Go Outdoors doing, right? So our first two programs that we want to highlight in this session, because they are truly really working to diversify, to be inclusive. So our first program, which we've highlighted this year, is our Outdoors One two, three program. And you'll see there, again, it's probably not where you can read all the little pieces of it. It is a free program that we are actually offering to schools because in partnership with multiple other pieces, we wanted to say, how do we look at a diverse population that maybe doesn't have a direct connection to the outdoor environment, to, their, to the outdoors? Let's start in the classroom or let's start in a safe space. So everybody usually feels safe in an inside place where somebody's coming to talk with them. So we started it as part one. All right, we're going to come into your classroom and we are going to offer a watershed education lesson. And again, that's with our partnership with the Philadelphia Water Department to subcontract. And so that's safe. The kids aren't being taken right out into, the, into nature, if you will, and saying, oh, we're going to just go explore. No, we're bringing it to them. We're talking about something that's important. It's a concept that everybody understands water. We can't live without it. And so then the next piece, again, we go to that same school or that same class or that same after-school program, neighborhood community meeting if it is, and we offer part two, which is an outdoor activity right on site in their neighborhood so they understand that nature exists, that the outdoors exist in their community. Because the first, or I should say, and this happens with teachers as well, teachers that are right here in our public schools and will say, hey, we want to come on site and we want to do a nature program. And we've heard it so many times. Well, nature doesn't exist here around our school. Well, I guarantee 100% that it does. Because we've done enough programs where we come in and we do, when we start the Outdoors 1, 2, 3 program, in that second session, we do ask them, do they think that nature exists in their neighborhood. And they will say, nope, nothing. And so they, they don't believe that. But our youth, and that's what's so important here, our youth, if they don't believe that nature, the outdoors exists where they're at, 
then we do have a true, um, what is it? We have work to do. So that's why we're working on this. So we've offered the outdoor activity where we walk them around their schoolyard. Again, this is in their neighborhood where they feel safe. So we've started with the first lesson, which is indoors, talking about water. Then we offer the second lesson, which we go back on site. We give them binoculars, or we do um, field guides with trees, and we do tree identification, or we do insect walks. And so that's our second piece. And then the third piece is we actually invite them. And again, this, this program is through partnerships. We invite and pay for a field trip for the buses. And that is really a helpful piece for our school. So then the field trip can be to a local environmental center. And then it could also be to a treatment plant for water. And then also we do where we could actually go to a interpretive center, if you water works interpretive center. So that's how that program works. And we have seen um, quite a bit of success. This was our first year piloting it. So we haven't really gotten all the feedback from those that participated just yet because we have a couple that are still moving forward in it. But we'll keep you posted based on it. Or if you have interest in that, then let us know. And then one of our other programs, which is really working in the community, there's good outdoors in my neighborhood. So there's Good Outdoors in My Neighborhood started where we wanted to really educate families together right in their community. So we partnered with two schools. Now the schools were really the location. They weren't opening their doors. It was because we knew that the schools were something that the parents would know of or the caregivers would know about and they would feel safe going there. So we would meet in the schoolyard, but the buildings weren't open to us. It wasn't like we were going inside. We would meet there. And then we would go, just like you see in the picture. We would actually walk the kids, in the, or I should say the families, around the block in their neighborhood and help them to start identifying what's in their neighborhood that could be good. In that particular scene, we were looking at weeds, if you will, what we usually call it the edible plant walk. So we were really looking at identifying things that they could find. But one of the challenges, and the challenge in this program was really in regards to even the, the families as a whole wanting to engage with the environment right there in front of them. It was very different, and especially this was one of those things where we asked if they wanted to sit, because that picture is while we're on the walk, but even in the schoolyard when we asked them if they wanted to sit, and this was sitting on the ground, nobody wanted to sit. So that's one of the challenges we have to always make sure we're keeping uh, taking into account that not everybody's going to want to sit on the ground, even if the ground is well manicured and safe and that kind of thing. And then another challenge is really getting parents to want to come to the program. So we do have challenge efforts in regards to recruitment. And again, that's why we use the school, because we can send out the flyers with all the kids and move from there. And at the end of the program, we did a culminating field trip, which was pretty successful. We still got over 50 families that called. Unfortunately, about 10 actually showed up that day, and we were offering this all free. But we do realize that there's a challenge and a disconnect, and we're working through that as well to find out how we can improve. And part of it is really going into these programs on a consistent basis and being in the neighborhood through the flea markets with Keisha Martin mentioned earlier. So I'm going to turn it over to Keisha, because she's going to talk a little bit about some of the diversity and inclusion um, programs that are therapy-based. So Keisha, feel free to take it over with that. All right, everybody, Keisha's back. So I'm going to make it personal now. So I'm going to shout out, is it Lo Huddlemeyer? Lo loved the picture that we had there. So thank you, Lo, for that. Just want to shout you out. So now I want to make something personal here. So I'm going to bring it back just a little bit. We talked about diverse people, diverse perspectives. And so if you're anything like me, I'm one of those people that likes to kind of kind of be a feeler sometimes. So for me right now, my hand is on my heart and I'm making it personal. I am not sure what the demographics you guys all represent out there in the world, but I wanted to kind of make you think a little bit about where you've come from or what your experience has been. Because we talked about diverse people, diverse perspectives. What do people really want to do as far as utilizing their parks and doing things outdoors? We talked about the Hispanic and Latino culture, how they really enjoy 
getting group things out there. Now, again, I don't know who you are. If you're out there, you know, put it out there on that participant feedback sheet and let me know what your thoughts are. But have you ever been to a Hispanic or Latino gathering that has happened in a park or even in a backyard? I mean, my personal experience is it is amazing and there are so many people and the food is amazing. So if you've done that, you've kind of connected a little bit personally with what are the important things that you're doing out there or what are the things that are important to that particular people, so to speak. Um, if you have a friend, a relative, or you know somebody from a traditionally uh, African-American, black community, and you've ever been to a gathering in that respect, or have you been out on a basketball court and played basketball or a team sport or something that has been traditionally something that has been done by an African-American community. So again, I want to make it personal a little bit and kind of speak to what is it that you are doing or the people you know or your workforce. Have you reached out or done anything that way? And the last one is women, okay? So Tarsha and I clearly identify as women and we do have children. And so a lot of times our programs are highly attended by women. And so they do like the idea of that um, secure group format, there's other children around. So just keeping it personal and thinking about our personal experiences and what is important for us when we are outdoors. Because again, people are going to differ. However, our interests may be the same. It's how they are demonstrated. So now we're going to transition a little bit because now we talk about diversity when it refers to our our special needs population, which is a very different area of diversity. It's a it's a, it's, it's a group of people that are sometimes overlooked when we talk about the outdoors. Now, if any of your lives have been touched by children with special needs, adults with special needs, then you know that this is a very, um, a very limited group when we talk about the outdoors. Um, so as you know, me, Keisha, my background, I'm a speech and language pathologist by training. And so I have worked significantly in schools and with special needs populations. And so one thing that's near and dear to my heart is working with kids that have limitations, so to speak. And so we developed programming that really focuses on reaching that population. So the thing, nature intervention, you see there, it was really a brainchild of mine because I recognize that families and parents of children that, you know, are out and about or they can't necessarily participate in the environment in the same way, I've found that they really want experiences and they want their children to participate in nature and activities, but they just don't know how to do it. And so our nature intervention program really reaches those kids. It's an hour and a half format. It's very much um, hands-on. It really kind of looks at kids in four different sections different areas. So it's our kids with speech and language needs, it's one group. Our kids on the autism spectrum is another group. Our kids with learning difficulties is one, and our sensory impaired kids are another. So again, we're trying to still put nature in the parents' hands to be able to get their kids exploring because again, each session their parents do come with them and they are able to experience nature in, in, in a way that is tailored to their deficit. The other program you'll see there is our Watershed is an Open Book program. That is a partnership program that we are doing in partnership with Fairmount Waterworks, and it is funded through the William Penn Foundation. This is a program that is geared toward our three to five-year-olds, okay? Right now, we have expanded the age. It is three to eight-year-olds. However, the idea is that there is so much that we can do with our watershed education. So we decided that we could put together a program that really focuses on early literacy skills. When we talk about those families that are in those disadvantaged communities, sometimes literacy is one big thing that we look at, but how do we kind of make literacy fun and look at an informal way to do that? Well, William Penn Foundation was looking for people that can do that. And so we are doing that with our three to eight-year-olds, using the watershed as basically a backdrop for learning um, literacy. So doing like phonic skills, rhyming words, putting words together. And so we are doing that using this program. So that's me. And then let's see, Tarsha's up next, I think. Let me see. So hopefully that's personal. You guys can relate to any of those stories. You can give us a shout out and let us know if there's something you want to share. All right. So those were four of our 
strong programs that are really in the community that are really looking at diversity in, in multiple ways through family engagement, through youth education, um, through therapy styles, but embedding the subtle pieces of environment. So those are some of the things that we're doing. But we also wanted to give you some resources if you don't aren't familiar with them already. So other programs and organizations to know, and Keisha and I pretty much have affiliations with all of them. So one is Diverse Environmental Leaders National Speakers Bureau. So if you're ever thinking for your organization, or if you're like, I really do not know those of color, or I want to learn more people of color across the nation, or even local, because I think there's probably representation across every state almost for someone that can be a resource to you. And so I would say definitely consider thinking about that, going to their website and um, learning about them. Another is Outdoor Afro. And if you haven't heard of that organization, I would say definitely think about that one as well. They have multiple chapters throughout the country. And it is really where they're focusing specifically on um, where I think their motto is really where black people and nature meet. So, and they use an online social network to do so. Another is Wilderness Inquiries Canoe Mobile, and that actually goes throughout the, I, I, I wish I could give it more justice, but we wrote a little um, brief description right there. But it does, it really does engage youth from various audiences to their waterways. So that's one of the other ones that's a really good resource to think about if you're really trying to, how do we create a program? How do we look at engaging new audiences? So, right. Also in Allentown, there is Camp Compass. And so again, if you're looking for student participation, if you're looking at different ways, maybe you want feedback. Because one of the things that we always are trying to find is really where is the information? How do students feel? How do people of color in general feel? Yes, Keisha and I are people of color and we've been doing this work, but we're still learning as well. What are the thoughts about the outdoors, environmental education? And maybe it's just time to have focus groups with some of these audiences and learn from their perspective. So that's Camp Compass. And then Nature PHL, formerly Nature RS. And I know that it's a big movement throughout the country in multiple cities to use nature and offer prescriptions through healthcare providers for putting out opportunities to engage in the outdoors and improve health outcomes and have those health benefits. So that's localized here in the Philadelphia area. I know that there's Boston. I think there's something in California. But these are things to really think about. And maybe your sites could become part of that. But it's just thinking about where to connect, how to use that. And then, of course, Pennsylvania Association of Environmental Educators. Oh, it says education there, but that's OK. Pennsylvania Association of Environmental Educators. That is another resource because it's a statewide. And there was a project which was called EE Capacity. And you can learn more by going to websites and learning. But they were really looking at connecting diverse audiences to environmental education. And it was a, I believe it was a four and a half, five year grant funded initiative throughout the country. So, just other resources that can be considered. So now we've talked about some of our programs, what's worked, and some of the successes, challenges. And also, if you have questions about what success was looking like, or the challenges, or if there's something that you've tried and maybe you want our feedback on, we can provide that for you. And feel free to put that in the questions box if necessary. So where do you start? So now you've got some, you know, hopefully some inspiration. And you've got a little bit of you know, background information. And it's something that your organization is finding important, which is why you're here on the call. But where do you start? All right, so you've had the question party. But we're going to question party again now, right? So that's where we have some things that you might want to decide on for how to start. All right, Keisha back on the mic. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit. And let me just put a Shout out there. So I want to make sure I'm shouting all of y'all out to tell you, if you have something you want to comment on, if you want to share something you're doing, just go ahead and write that in the box. And I am going to do a little bit of information on what you can do. Okay, So where do you start? Hey, you say, I want to do something. I'm not sure what to do. Or maybe you're already in the midst of something and you're saying, how can I move that forward a little bit better? So 
going through these things, you have to kind of always take into consideration. Tarsha and I kind of jumped in, um, you know, all ahead, thought we were going to change the world in like one night, okay? So it didn't happen that way. And then we thought, well, maybe we're going to change the world in a week. And so then we realized, and then we went to a year, and now it is eight years later, and we're changing the city slowly, but we still got one little corner. So, so it doesn't really move as fast as we'd like. So we have to understand, you know, how long are we committed to this for? So that's one of the biggest things I think that organizations or places need to think about, like how long are we in this for? And you have to kind of think about, you know, what types of events. Are we in this for a year so we plan a big event? Or are we in this for five years and we want to change how our whole organization looks? And when I say organization, there can be the administrative level of an organization or there can be the clientele of an organization. Who are the people visiting? So you kind of have to think about it in those terms also. And then one of the things that we've learned too, you've got to kind of think about who's in it from your team. You know, again, if there's only one person who's really moving that forward and that person leaves, whoa, what's going to happen to that long-term effort that you put in there? So you've got to kind of make sure that you've got several people who are committed to the ongoing or the big event that you are going to do. Again, you've got to kind of think about youth or family, you know, depending on what your organization does, who you're trying to reach, where you're trying to go with it, you kind of have to stick to it. Like Tarsha and I thought we were going to change things from the, the family down, taking our adults and saying, bring your kids, but we realize now it's going to be kids, bring your family, you know. So you have to kind of think about what's going to be your target and how you're going to, to, to reach that group. So one of the things you can do, reach out to a local school, which has been phenomenally great for us as far as getting more people involved, or families, you know, meeting people where they're at. If you're trying to reach into a new, a new area or a new group, you know, who do you already have that might be um, participating and who might be interested? So that's what you need to kind of take into consideration. Is it going to be subtle nature or full environmental? That is one of those things where you have got to kind of say, okay, well, you know, I'm trying to reach a different demographic, you know, well, there's not really any really great spots for doing, you know, I don't know what you might want to do, aquatic sciences or something. You might be like, well, I can't really do that. So it has to be like a nature-based lesson that's a little bit toned down. So what can you do with the people that are there? So how far do you want to go or how deep is that lesson? And what are the, what are the, the supplies or materials, the equipment that you have in order to provide that? Okay, again, location-wise, you're going to have to think about that and where you want to be at, you know, using partners. We've talked through that a little bit there. Being flexible, that's going to be the biggest thing because, again, when we're meeting people from different backgrounds or we're trying to reach communities that aren't really aware of what we mean when we say environmental ed or nature awareness, you've got to kind of break that down and really pick a niche that you're really going to work with. And so... That's one thing, being flexible to what you want to say and what you want to teach, what you want people to take away from is going to be something you have to really do. Um, yeah, and then thinking about your level, their level, as far as the people you're trying to reach, just kind of that's, that's kind of the underlying theme there. That's what you really want to kind of just, what do I want them to take away from this? Do I want them to come back to my program? Do I want them to start to independently take on different types of things on their own? You know, so you have to kind of identify what would be that level of success for you if you are trying to move forward with an initiative that includes a diverse group or a disadvantaged group. So those are kind of the general things that you should take into consideration. I mean, you know, we could do a whole hour on that. But so I'm not sure, let me see, if anybody has any questions about that, if you wanted to kind of share something that's been a success, we'd love to hear about it. So, or if there's just something you want to say that's been impactful for you, that would be wonderful. So if you want to um, do that, kind of go in, and then I am going to turn it over to Tarsha, who's going to do our conclusion, and then we will probably throw out a couple of questions of our own to ourselves, because we've got a kind of quiet group out there. So Tarsha, you're up. All right, so in conclusion, so one, before starting and thinking about, I mean, if you're already in it, that's great, by all means. But you might want to step back and think about, all right, what is our definition? Because if it's not working, then something's wrong. So sit back and say, all right, let's define this. Let's really talk about it. Because sometimes some people feel like, yes, I want to think this through and talk this out, and some people might not. But if it's all for the 
um, strategic vision to diversify, then everybody needs to get to the table and have you know, a talk about the definitions that are being used and how we're going forward with our um, energy level. And then also just have that question party, you know, break out the chips and salsa and start asking questions. But it's really that opportunity where there is no question that should go without being answered or just put out there on the table. Research other organizations or programs so you have that to go forward. So if somebody else is doing something or to have somebody that can offer more support or direction on it, research those organizations. You know, have another question party. All right, now that we understand the organization, we know what the tone is, we know the definition, now let's ask the questions where we want to go, what do we want to do? And that's what Tisha had highlighted in that slide where is it local, is it in the neighborhood, is it at our site, is it subtle, the language that we're using. And then establish partnerships if you don't have them, if you feel they're necessary, by all means. Partnerships have allowed us to come a long way in regards to what we're doing. And then Try and move forward, put that plan in place, and be flexible, be patient, transparent as possible by all means with the community that you're working in. Hey, this is our first time trying this. Do you believe that this can work? How do you feel about it? But really sticking with it because change doesn't happen overnight, and I think we all know that. But we have to still be diligent and committed enough. Even if some of our programs have not been as successful as we wanted them to, but we still said we're going to move that forward and the community has recognized that, that we're not there for this one and done opportunity. We're there because we see a vision and we want to engage and educate. And then assess, you know, use your measurements. If you develop, what does it look like? Is it where we are bringing more people from this community to visit us? Is it where we have more donors from this community? Is it um, we have more family participation? But really assess and measure. Is it working? Is it not? Um, do we need to regroup, redefine, question party again? And it's like the cycle continues. So hopefully we have actually went through all of the details that we decided as a format for this session and this webinar. And so we would love to say, number one, you know, thank you on behalf of us. And we would like to also answer a couple questions or hear from you if there's anything you would like to add. So we're reading through as we Okay, Keisha back on the mic. We've got a question. All right. I don't know, I want to shout you out, Paige. This is from you. Okay, it's, the question is, are there any groups in the Allentown area that we know of that will run the therapeutic recreation programs in a park? Well, you know, that is a wonderful question. And you know what? The, I ref, I'm believing you're asking about the nature intervention program that I spoke of. That is a brainchild of mine that I just recently started, and so that program right now will only be offered in the Philadelphia area this summer, and it'll be offered at Aubrey Arboretum and over at Smith Playground. But as soon as, if there's somebody that's interested in kind of coming down and taking a look at that, you know, feel free to reach out to us and I can talk you through some of the things that we're doing here. But thank you so much for that question. So we've got, um, Keisha and Tyson, I've got a this is Nikki, I'm going to interrupt as well regarding that Allentown um, page. You could also look into the Lehigh Valley Center for Independent Living as well. Um, they have spoken at our Therapeutic Recreation Institute and the Pennsylvania Recreation and Park Society Annual Conference, um, and they may be able to help or point you in the right direction. And we just put a link in the chat box to their website as well. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, we got another question. Shout out to Kate, Kate Ronan. It says, you mentioned Project WET. Any other curriculum or activity resources have we found helpful for nature in your own backyard? So our, that's, um, I believe you're referring to are there good outdoors in your neighborhood? So our programs, yeah. So Project WET is one program that we have used quite a bit of information from that is basically water education for teachers. Water education for teachers is what that is. Now, we have a relationship with Fairmont Waterworks through the Philadelphia Water Department. They use a curriculum known as Understanding the Urban Watershed mm -hmm. for middle schoolers, so it is for an older group. Now, there are programs out there like Project Wild and Project, yeah, and then Project Wet. 
But there is, um, if you're interested in specifically a lot of water-based education, I know that Stroud is one place that people refer to. But I'm sure that there might be some others. If anybody wants to put some things out there in the chat box, that would be great. So now, Tarsha's oh, mm -hmm. got something to add. Yes. Yeah. Just one small piece in regards to that nature in your own backyard. And sometimes what it is, and, I, and, and through our Outdoors 1, 2, 3 program, we are learning at the same time. Again, this was our pilot year. And there is concrete surroundings around us at these schoolyards. And it amazes me how little green space there is at times. One thing, we went around the block and we gave them little insect jars. And we said, what can you find? And again, the teachers aren't as, like nature doesn't exist there. But one of the kids, so as we were walking, so we saw multiple birds. We gave them binoculars and saw multiple birds. So I would say bird identification is always huge in regards to nature in the backyard. And then also, um, the insect jars. So they went around to see what they could find. And as soon as we said answer insects as well, we had tons of ants in the collection box. They were trying to catch some bees. And then also, one kid actually lifted up. And again, we have to acknowledge because I don't like to overlook pieces in regards to there is litter in these communities that we're going into. There is trash, but also at the same time, trash does bring about a type of ecosystem, if you will, or a habitat for different insects. So one kid did catch a cockroach, which I always said, oh my goodness. But again, we have to really think about what it is that our youth, our families, what are they seeing in their neighborhood? And that doesn't take away, because again, I always say, what birds do you see? And pigeons, and I have to say, pigeons are birds in certain environments by all means, but some people will disregard that. And it's something we have to really utilize and think about. But I want to just add that in there. Just insect jars and binoculars will do amazing things for nature in the backyard or in an urban community. So hopefully that's helpful to you, Kate. OK, we have a couple minutes left. And so I'm just going to put something out there that we've been asked in the past, since we sometimes get people who will ask questions like, they ask things like, you know, they go back to their workplaces and it, they say things like, we all look the same. What do we do? And this is when we tell them, utilize the resources that you have. Be honest and open. If you have a friend, and again, that's why I say make it personal. If you have a friend that is of color or a friend who grew up or is part of a disadvantaged community, you know, draw on them. Be honest and open. There is nothing wrong with transparency. And sometimes we say don't be afraid of them being a little bit defensive, but you know, being open and honest about why you're asking. You know, you can let them know you're trying to move forward and do something different. Draw on maybe a family that you know that does participate in your programs and just being open and honest and saying, hey, you know, can we kind of have a sit down and, and talk about what are some of the things that speak to you or why do you come or what's different or you know, just like I said, honesty and transparency can go a long way. So when you're thinking about moving into diverse communities or disadvantaged communities and working with people from varying backgrounds, no, honesty and transparency is great. It doesn't mean that every time and every person is going to be willing, but you do, you do try. Okay, so right. I'm going to let Tarsha close this out since we have 30 seconds. Well, 30 seconds. I just want to go back to Kate's question as well. There is another strong resource I forgot to mention. I have to say it helped us develop our program for uh, Nature in My Neighborhood. It is What's Good in My Hood, I believe it is. It's a workbook. And it was developed by Akima Price, but it was out of New York with a program she was working with. But if you type it in, I hope that you can find it. If you do not email me, I will send you a direct link so that you can have it. But that's a really good one. And then Neighborhood Explorers, I think, is another one that is actually through the um, Park Center. Okay, thank you all so much. All right, I just want to say thank you so much to Keisha and Tarsha for speaking with us today. It was a fantastic presentation and so much good information. And don't worry, we have all the links to everything that was uh, talked about during the webinar today. We will send that out in a follow-up email with the presentation uh, recording and PDF of the slides. Um, so thank you all for taking your time out of your busy schedules. We know for many of you, taking an hour out of your schedule is a huge commitment. And thank you, Keisha and Tarsha. Um, just a reminder, if you want to become a Get Outdoors PA community partner, you can follow the link to the slide 
um, on the page, oh, sorry, wow, you can click the link on the slide um, that you see now for more information, or you can contact me, Nikki Tusher, um, at Get Outdoors PA. Um, thank you so much, and we hope you have a fantastic day.